Good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles. And here's some of the stories we're watching tonight. A Denver high school student shoots two administrators while being searched for a weapon, then gets away, prompting a massive manhunt. The chaotic aftermath and the demand for answers from parents and students who say they've been warning this would happen for months. How many marches do our kids have to go to your office for this to stop? A rare tornado is spotted outside Los Angeles, capping a wild couple of days of wind and rain in California that has left hundreds of thousands without power and at least five dead. And TikTok on Capitol Hill. A day before he's set to testify before Congress, the CEO of TikTok tries taking his case to the American people. Some politicians have started talking about banning TikTok. Now, this could take TikTok away from all 150 million of you. Plus, we're going to tell you why a number of school districts are now suing some of the biggest social media companies around, including TikTok. And we'll take you to the middle of the Pacific Ocean for a dramatic rescue after a sailboat crashes into a whale. It sounded like something broke, and uh, we immediately looked to the side and saw a really big whale. Tonight, another school shooting in Denver, Colorado. But the details on this one, they, they really show how terrifying and how complex this whole issue is in a really stark way. First of all, this is a case in which the students suspected to be the gunmen had been on the administration's radar to the point that every day, according to what they call a safety plan, they were required to pat this student down, search him for weapons. And today, when they did, they found a gun, and that's when shots rang out. Student has a weapon, do not know where they are. We need two buses, and then we need two structures inside. Suspect is not in the school, but still on the loose. Now, this happened at Denver's East High School, which is right here, not even 10 minutes away from the Colorado State Capitol. And here's why the proximity to Colorado's central or center of political power is, is really important. Less than a month ago, Another student was killed near this school, and since then, students have been so worried about a school shooter that they walked out of class and they marched to the Capitol to demand, to demand that something, something different be done. And today, after the shooting, parents rushing to that school saw police giving an update to the press. They surrounded the police, and they told them exactly what their kids had been dealing with. Come on, you guys. You guys need to get it. Be on top of it. These are our kids. I don't want to come and get my kid and have her take her to the funeral on a casket. I don't want that. What are you guys going to do? What's more important, being safe or feeling safe? Yeah. yeah. We need armed security. This is this is gross. Every day for two weeks, they were locked down. How can they possibly learn? They can't. Now, the suspect here is 17-year-old Austin Lyle. The two administrators who were shot are in the hospital in serious condition. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Mara Barrett. Mara, uh, talk to us about this student. What kind of past behavior are we talking here that would prompt a search every single day? Right, something like that, that action every single day comes off as kind of a surprise, even in this climate where we're seeing so many more school shootings and increased security measures at schools. But I want to be clear, even though the superintendent uh, of the Denver School District said that this is a common practice, this, this individualized safety plan, a, a safety plan that requires a daily pat-down insinuates a more serious uh, reason. And now we don't have exact details on all of that. There's a lot of things that are still uh, going on behind the scenes that they they can't report because the student is a minor. He's 17 years old. But we did hear from a spokeswoman at another school district up near Aurora, Colorado, uh, which is just outside Denver, saying that the student had been removed from that school district uh, because that he, he had acted out of uh, board, board qualified behavior, is how they phrased it. Uh, and so we don't know what exactly that means, but in terms of someone getting pat, patted down day to day coming to school, they were looking for weapons each day that he came into school. And today it was unfortunately the day that they found one. That is when they recovered a weapon, uh, saw it on his person, and that is when the shooting occurred. We then know that the student fled on foot. He ran away from the school. Uh, and the, at the time, police, uh, when they gave the latest update, said that they had not recovered the weapon either. Uh, and they're still searching for that student, Gotti. And Maura, this is a community that's already been through one student killed last month. Now this, uh, what are the things that they want done? 
I mean, you heard the anger in those parents' voices, understandably. They want to be able to have a safe place for their kids to go to school. The kids feel the same way. And this comes after a decision in the school district where they removed armed officers uh, from the school. And a lot of what you heard from parents was towards police was saying, we want protection back in the school district. And so the superintendent actually released a letter to the Board of Education today. And I want to read from it. And he said he's committing to having an armed officer at each comprehensive high school. He's going to continue having a uh, ongoing discussions with principals at each site to understand what the need and the desire for this resource is. And the superintendent, Dr. Alex Marrero, acknowledges that this goes against the policy that the school district has in place because they had made that decision to take armed officers off site uh, in a safety precaution. And he said uh, he can no longer stand on the sidelines. He writes, I'm willing to accept the consequences of my actions because this has been several times that he's gone to the hospital as a result of a shooting on a school campus. And so he's committing to taking that seriously, but obviously that doesn't excuse what has been going on uh, on school campuses and why we're seeing that frustration from both students and parents. Yeah, a very controversial ruling back in 2020 when they removed SRO officers from those Denver schools. Now something that they're going to be reconsidering. Mara, thanks so much. And tornadoes, bomb cyclones, and atmospheric rivers all in the last 24 hours here in California. Now, for people outside of California, I cannot stress how rare one of those is, let alone all three. And let's start with just that tornado because the footage is wild. Check this out. This was the tornado that touched down in Montebello. It damaged a few buildings, left a trail of destructions, and it knocked out power in the surrounding area. And in a nearby school, it sucked a teacher right out of a classroom. Thankfully, that teacher is okay. She was uh, left with a minor scrape and some scratches, but this tornado is coming after a rough bomb cyclone and heavy rains across California yesterday. At least five people were killed, some due to falling trees, which could be found all over the state, blocking roads and damaging houses and vehicles. Meanwhile, up in the mountains, snow continues to pile up, making driving conditions a bit rough. ABC National Correspondent Miguel Almaguer joins us now. Miguel, a tornado in California. I can see devastation behind you. Had to check the bug there. It says Los Angeles. This is something that we normally see in, in Oklahoma, but do you ever expect to see something like this so close to home here? Well, you know, Gotti, you're an L.A. guy. I've been here for 15 years. I've never quite seen anything like this, especially in the Los Angeles area. We're in a packing business here. You can see these crates here have been tossed around. Carlos, our photographer, is going to take a couple of steps back. We're going to swing around this forklift and show you more of what we've seen at several businesses. All the roof and awning here is tossed on the ground. But this is what we've noticed. Many holes have been punched through roofs after you saw that video of that tornado swirling around. Now, the damage here is extensive. It's incredible. No one was killed in this. It was on the ground just a short time, we're told. But folks said it sounded like an earthquake. They could hear the rumbling. They could feel the wall shaking. And when this was all coming down, there was actually several people in all of these local businesses. Again, Gotti, incredible. Not a single person died in this tornado, Gotti. Were people pretty surprised by that? I, I, they think earthquake. They run outside. They look up. And, and they literally see a tornado. Yeah, I mean, that's the first thought for us here in California, right? You think of an earthquake, and the damage looks like that. You can see all of the stuff that's been strewn around here, but this was certainly what appears to be a tornado. We saw that video of it kind of funneling through the air, everything swirling around. When people got outside, that's when they realized they were in the middle of this heavy storm. Many folks inside didn't even know it was raining during when this tornado first touched down. As a matter of fact, as you know, and I know you're getting sent to talk to Bill Karens after us here, but there's been some wild weather across. California. A bomb cyclone actually touched down in Northern California. So many trees in that area fell and killed people. It's just incredible. Even in Northern California, there's only a handful of people that died in the storms there. This has been a crazy weather maker here. We're seeing it more and more often, but it is fairly rare for California, Gotti. And Miguel, I know you and I have been saying the dreaded word earthquake. That building behind you, I bet it has some earthquake retrofitting, uh, but houses, buildings in L.A., I don't know if they're, they're built for high wind. Looking up at that roof there, uh, what do you think people learned from, from what happened today? 
Well, you know, Gotti, as California natives, we're, we're not really taught what to do in a tornado. We do have them from time to time in California, again, rarely in Los Angeles. And as you mentioned, the facilities here just aren't built for tornadoes. You can see the, the roof here is fairly thin. We're used to heavy rains on occasion, but we're told, at least people were being told when this was unfolding to stay inside, to find a secure building or an area they could be in, likely a bathroom. Those are typically well insulated. So folks here are now learning what it's like not only to be prepared for an earthquake, as you mentioned, but apparently also tornadoes, Gotti. Oh, finger cross, fingers crossed this is, oh, this is the last of the, the wild weather. Miguel, thanks so much. Let's hope so. You bet. And NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joins us now. Bill, a uh, tornado in L.A., that's, that's rare, right? Uh, it's pretty rare. I mean, it's not unheard of. The last one was two years ago, but uh, I mean, it looked like something from a movie, Gotti. I mean, it was just pretty incredible. Uh, just, you know, all the shingles that were being lifted up. And this was from a, a far away angle. So you could see the bottom of it and you could see all the shingles that were in there, all the debris floating around and swirling around the bottom of the tornado. You could see that condensation of the uh, funnel to the higher portion of it there. And then the rotating wall cloud at the very top of your screen. That was just yeah, incredible scenes there. I mean, this is literally eight to ten miles from downtown LA. Uh, so this is what it looked like on radar and you can see the storm. Here's downtown LA and here's Montebello and the storm was <laughs> kind of in between those wow. two areas here and I mean it was incredibly close. Uh, There's only one lightning strike with the storm. That was it. We didn't really think there was much of a chance of tornadoes today but it just proves it only takes one. So again here's Los Angeles. There's Dodger Stadium and ten miles away is where this tornado was reported. Now the National Weather Service Gotti will go. They'll investigate it. They'll exactly how strong it was and how long it was on the ground for and how wide it was but uh, you know incredible pictures I mean I, I don't think the movies could make it uh, look more real uh, than it was uh, Bill just to recap here uh, so we had snow at the Hollywood sign we have a tornado we've been talking about 12 atmospheric rivers and now we're hearing a bomb cyclone in addition yeah. to this tornado uh, what exactly is a bomb cyclone and how does that differ from an atmospheric river it was funny, Gotti. I always said I never would want to be a Los Angeles weather person because it's like boring, right? <laughs> like that's not true that's anymore. True. Uh, so here, here, let's talk about: is it just a storm or is it a bomb cyclone? So if you're just a storm, yeah, you have strong winds. You can have rain. Can usually very chilly conditions. Could be snow or rain. Doesn't matter. A bomb cyclone is an intensifying storm with a pressure drop. And it's a strict definition. It has to be 24 millibars in 24 hours. They can measure these things, so it has a very strict definition. And only the storms that intensify very quickly become bomb cyclones. Often you hear them with nor'easters in New England in the winter time. But you can get them on the West Coast with the biggest storms. And that one, this one, did qualify, Gotti, as that. It is and was a bomb cyclone. And it can be an atmospheric river at the same time, too. So the bomb cyclone pulls the atmospheric river from the tropics into California. That's what happened this time. Wow. And so now that this storm is moving out of California, it, does it hit the East Coast? I mean, and does it hit the East Coast with the same type of intensity that we saw here? Not, I'm not so worried about the East Coast, but the middle of the country, they can have their own severe weather to deal with. So all the winds are done. We're improving things in California. We do have the flood watches that we'll, I'd like to get through this tonight before we completely eliminate all the California problems. But let's fast forward into tomorrow. Isolated large hail threat. We're back here in Texas into southern Oklahoma. But I have my eyes on Friday, and it's the same poor people that all winter long, Gotti, have been dealing with severe weather and tornadoes. And we're going to do it again from central Louisiana, southern Louisiana, uh, Arkansas into areas of Mississippi. That's the greatest risk of maybe even a strong tornado or two. So we'll keep our eyes on that. And on top of all that, flash flooding could be a big story on the Ohio, near the Ohio River come this weekend. Uh, I'm scared to see what next, wait, what next week brings. Uh, Bill, me thanks too. so much. Don't jinx us. <laughs> yeah. And weeks after the conviction of Alec Murdoch, the legal tycoon's family is once again in the headlines. And it all stems back to something that we touched on briefly the night Alec Murdoch was convicted. Another suspicious death close to the family. And we now know that the 2015 death of a South Carolina man is being investigated as a homicide. That one was 19-year-old Stephen Smith, who died from what was thought to be a hit and run about 15 miles away from the Murdoch home. But because of the trial, investigators are now taking another look at his death. NBC's Katie Beck is in South Carolina with the story. 
South Carolina Law Enforcement Division investigators offering an update in the Stephen Smith case on Wednesday, saying the case is open, active, and classified as a homicide. This comes after Stephen Smith's mother has been making calls for an independent investigation into her son's death, saying that she never believed the case was a hit and run and that her son was murdered. She is calling for an exhumation of his body and a new autopsy. NBC News has recovered the original case files from 2015 and has been digging through the evidence. It appears that from the beginning there was a lot of conflict over whether this was a hit and run or a homicide. Investigators at the time said they hadn't found any evidence to indicate that a car had struck Stephen Smith in that road and had advocated that it be classified a homicide. They said the medical examiner's report indicated otherwise. Sandy Smith says she continues to fight for justice. This was not a hit and run. I think he was murdered and I just need the proof. To me, it just felt like Stephen didn't matter. Yet yeah, he didn't, he was just a, a gay guy. <laughs> yeah, he didn't matter. His life didn't matter. But it does matter to me and my family. It was all fishy from the beginning. And I don't know who did it, but I want to know why you did it, and I want to find out who you are. And then I want to talk to you as a mother. Nowhere in the 2015 case files does it indicate that investigators attempted to speak with or spoke with Buster Murdoch. Murdoch's attorneys say they never did. Earlier this week, Buster Murdoch denying any implication of any involvement in Smith's death. Back to you. Katie Beck, thanks so much. And we're just getting started tonight. We are covering the future of one of the world's biggest apps. Will TikTok get banned in the United States? We'll have more on the CEO testifying tomorrow on Capitol Hill. Also in the hot seat, the CEO of Norfolk Southern taking tough questions. We'll tell you more about what he said about that crash in East Palestine, Ohio. And in the future of everything, could schools lead the way to regulating big tech? We're gonna break down a massive class action lawsuit. That's coming up, so stay tuned. Every day, I use TikTok to share the love of my family and our journey through foster care and adoption. Since joining the Learn on TikTok program in July of 2020, I've not only secured over six figures of creator income, I have a book coming out in 2024, and all of which are supporting my dream of advocating on behalf of my own community, the disabled community. It's not about sales and exposure. It's about the impact I and people that look like me can have on our community simply by accessing and contributing to the TikTok space. A TikTok ban wouldn't just put my business at risk. 95% of my livelihood would disappear overnight. That's something you don't see every day. A bunch of TikTok stars on Capitol Hill protesting against a possible nationwide ban. Also in Washington, this guy, the CEO of the app, uh, Sho Chu, he is set to testify before Congress tomorrow. But first, he seems to be trying to get ahead of things by taking his message directly to users. Take a listen. Some politicians have started talking about banning TikTok. Now, this could take TikTok away from all 150 million of you. I'll be testifying before Congress later this week to share all that we're doing to protect Americans using the app and deliver on our mission to inspire creativity and to bring joy. And Ryan Tracy is a tech reporter from The Wall Street Journal. His latest piece titled TikTok Stars Rally in Washington Against Apps, a Potential U.S. Ban. He joins me now. I, I'm not sure if it came across your For You page, uh, but I saw a Chu's message on TikTok, then Twitter, then Instagram seemed to be everywhere. Uh, what do you think he's going to be saying to lawmakers tomorrow on Capitol Hill? Well, thanks for having me. You know, show's going to want to focus on substance. There are concerns that lawmakers have around national security, around how the TikTok algorithm works. And in his view, TikTok has responses to those substantive questions, whether it's the, this plan they have to secure Americans' data with the whole apparatus they're building here, uh, or the things that they do to, to deal with harmful, harmful content. So that's what he wants to talk about. But you know, lawmakers are going to are going to press him on their views as well. And do you think that he's going to be able to bring something new to the table? I mean, we've seen TikTok responding uh, to a lot of these allegations for quite some time with some very lengthy statements. Do you think that uh, he'll be providing anything new tomorrow when he when he meets with Congress? 
Well, we did see his testimony earlier this week, and there wasn't big news in that. There was news in that video you just played about 150 million Americans using TikTok. That's a number we didn't know before a few days ago. And the other part of his message is, you know, not explicit, but perhaps not so subtle. And that is, you know, if Congress or the Biden administration were to try to ban this app, that a lot of people use it and that there would be a popular backlash to that. And that, that was part of the strategy today with bringing these creators to Capitol Hill as a reminder of that, you know, a not so subtle reminder, really. And, and in what he said, you know, directly, 150 million of you, audience, could lose, this, lose access to this app that you love. And yet we've seen a new poll released today that found more than 40% of Americans, at least according to this survey, would uh, support a ban uh, of TikTok uh, against 25% who said they oppose it. Uh, so 41% support the ban, 25% oppose it, 34% not sure. Uh, when you see these numbers, do those numbers jive with the 150 million monthly active users, which is what we saw from the CEO? Yeah, you know, I, I was fascinated by those numbers when I saw them. Another aspect of that poll, though, that was interesting was the answers often depended on your political party. You know, Republicans have been much more aggressive in calling for a ban of TikTok, and that's uh, part of their views on China and, and sort of the, um, the concerns around the rivalry with the U.S. economically and militarily and all of that. You know, I think that's coloring people's views. Um, Democrats you know, tend to rely more on young voters than Republicans, and young people are on TikTok. And so, you know, there's a partisan difference there as well. It also depends on whether you use the app. You know, it was fascinating. At the press conference outside the Capitol today, there were a few members of Congress who spoke about their own experiences on TikTok, and those were the members who were coming out calling, you know, talking about let's not ban this, that banning is not the right thing to do, and if you're concerned about social media, then address social media issues more broadly. And so, you know, whether or not you've used TikTok and the experience that you've had on it ha has a big effect on, on how people feel about this. Brian Tracy from the Wall Street Journal. Always love seeing your byline. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. And the CEO of Norfolk Southern was back on Capitol Hill today facing questions about railroad safety. And this comes more than six weeks after his company's train derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, sending toxins in the air. I am determined to make this right. Norfolk Southern continues to make good on its promise to clean the site safely, thoroughly, and with urgency. You have my personal commitment that we will get the job done and we help we will help these communities thrive. But one local who testified on Capitol Hill as well wants more than that. NBC's Ryan Noble has the story. When Misty Allison moved her young family to her husband's hometown of East Palestine, Ohio, her idyllic hopes for small town life did not include testifying in front of Congress. I could see a huge fireball from my driveway. In an instant, Misty and her children, ages seven and one, saw their lives turned upside down. And I always say that I never want to move unless something drastic happens. I never thought that would be a train derailing in our town. Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw, reluctant to promise basic changes on things like crew size. Will you commit to a, a two-person crew on all trains? Senator, we're a data-driven organization, and I'm not aware of any data that links crew size with safety. Do you disagree with Mr. Whitaker when he says that it would have been far worse? His testimony is loud and clear. It would have been worse if there was only one person uh, as a crew on that train. Do you, do you disagree with him? Senator, I believe that we have operations infrastructure on the ground to, to respond to derailments. I think you're not answering the question. Frustrating for Misty, whose son now dodges mud puddles, fearing they're contaminated, and his friends have invented ways to process their trauma. Kids are now playing a game that they created called evacuation during recess, um, where they pretend that they're packing up their stuff and then running around on the grass because they can't play on the playground. She believes only a generational commitment will allow her community to survive.
There are various pieces of legislation making its way through the House and Senate right now as it relates to reforming rail safety. And at this point, Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw has yet to endorse those plans in totality. But Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown told me something will eventually pass with or without Norfolk Southern's support. Gotti. And not even another day of rain here in Los Angeles can keep school workers from protesting in the streets. We are in the second day of a massive strike across the nation's second largest school district. Teachers, sanitation workers, even bus drivers are demanding better pay. Now we don't feel the appreciation. We feel like we're the little people at the bottom are not getting raises. It's affecting our households, you know, because everything is going up and except our salaries. And the pay raise they're asking for up to 30% to keep up with inflation. Here's CNBC special correspondent Scott Cohen reporting from the protests today about whether a deal is possible. Gotti, two days into this three-day strike, talks have now resumed between the union, representing some 30,000 L.A. school district service workers, and the district. Those talks apparently brokered by L.A. Mayor Karen Bass. The impact on this city has been significant. Some 400,000 students and their families affected. Picketers that we talked to today said that they sympathize, but they, too, have a mission. We just need to come to an agreement. Our kids are important. We also need to teach our kids that we need to stand up for what we think is right. Also significant, the support of the L.A. Teachers Union, which went out on strike in sympathy, many of their members out on the picket lines as well, and that was enough to shut down the nation's second largest school district in this dispute over wages. Gotti? NBC's Scott Cohen, thanks so much. And today is World Water Day, and we just want to share this with you. Two billion people on Earth don't have access to clean drinking water. Two billion. We're going to break down the growing crisis next. But first, you got to see this. This is a high stakes chase this afternoon after a young cow escaped a slaughterhouse in Brooklyn, New York. The calf didn't want any beef, so it steered clear of traffic and anyone trying to catch it. Although the calf was finally caught by wranglers, he also caught the hearts of people following that chase. Now some are calling for that calf to be moved to a sanctuary. <laughs> Hopefully not to the meatpacking district. Holy cow, hope that does not happen. We'll be right back. And it's time now for some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. The Manhattan Grand Jury investigating former President Trump will be back tomorrow. Sources are telling NBC News that the Manhattan District Attorney made the call to bring the jury back tomorrow. And the investigation is looking into alleged payments Trump made to a porn star Stormy Daniels. Trump denies any wrongdoing. According to a doctor's testimony, Gwyneth Paltrow's claim that a skier crashed into her and not the other way around is not possible. That skier is suing the actress over claims that she crashed into him back in 2016, which left him with broken ribs and brain damage. The radiologist testified that he doesn't think he would have sustained those injuries had he run into Paltrow. In California, five people were hurt when a condo exploded this morning near Mammoth Mountain. First responders found the collapsed building and had to pull survivors from the debris. And the Federal Reserve today announced an interest rate hike of 25 basis points. It is the ninth consecutive rate hike in the past year, making the rate the highest it's been since 2007. The Fed did say that hikes are nearing an end. And Giselle Bunshin is speaking out for the first time since her divorce with Tom Brady. In an interview with Vanity Fair, the Brazilian supermodel says it felt like, quote, death and rebirth. But despite the divorce, she still is his biggest cheerleader. And it seems like people in Washington can agree on very little these days. But one thing that has united Democrats, Republicans, and independents, it even transcends race and gender, and that is the fear of parallel parking. NBC's Gary Grumbach has more. In a city where power and status is everything, call it the great equalizer. Parallel parking, it's the bane of our existence. And in Washington, D.C., that's not up for debate. If you live in a district, you need to know how to parallel park. Keep my bumper off yours. The district removed parallel parking from their driving tests in 2009. Since they brought back the requirement in 2021, aspiring drivers have found themselves in a jam. The DMV says failure rates increased by 10% year over year. 
There's enough room I think I can usually manage, but uh can definitely see why some people would have some trouble. Well, uh, all the cars are very close to each other, and uh, at, at this point, look how I parked. I couldn't get, there is enough space, but I didn't maneuver enough. So what grade would you give yourself here today on your show? F. The struggle is real, but not just in D.C. Nearly half of all Americans have what's called parallelophobia, the fear of parallel parking. Their greatest concern? Holding up traffic. But if you're a soon-to-be driver, some good news. More than a dozen states have cut the maneuver from the exam in recent years. I gave it a shot, and let's just say there was room for improvement. I'm backing up. You know, this should be a lot easier to do if you didn't have a camera in the way. And see, I have a backup camera here, so that's kind of cheating. But we did all right. Let's see how far we are from the curb. How far are we from the curb, Andy? All right, not bad, not bad. But some teens are ditching all the hassle entirely. Just 25% of 16-year-olds had their license in 2021 down from 43% in 1995. So if you're not in a rush to get in the driver's seat or are anxious when you do, you're in good company. Gary Grumbach, NBC News, Washington. And what if we told you over 2 billion people don't have access to safe drinking water or that nearly half of the planet doesn't have access to proper sanitation? Well, according to the UN, that is the reality of the world that we live in right now. And they all outline all of this and more in their latest report for World Water Day, which is today. And before you say, well, the world is made up of mostly water, uh, let us explain. While more than 70% of the planet is covered with water, only 3% is fresh water. And of that fresh water, only 0.5% is available to us for use. The rest is either in glaciers or highly polluted or just inaccessible. And that scarcity is hitting the African region extremely hard. The UN says that 190 million children in just 10 countries are at high risk for water-related threats and diseases. But this isn't just a problem abroad. It's happening in our own backyard, like in Jackson, Mississippi, where they have been dealing with a water crisis for years. Let's, in, let's bring in Andrea Ballestero. She is the Associate Professor of Anthropology at USC, author of A Future History of Water. Andrea, just how dire is this water crisis here in the United States and around the world? It's something that should concern us all, and I always like to invite people to think about this question, not only as something that happens at a distance, as you nicely put it, but also very close by. We have uh, communities, whose water is polluted by chemicals. We have people that because of drought don't have access in the San Joaquin Valley, even if we have an, uh, an atmospheric river at the moment around us. So the situation is dire and that's why the World Water Day this year is dedicated to achieving the sustainable development goal number six, which uh, promised by, that by 2030, the world and all of the people in the world would have access not only to safe water, but also to sanitation. But unfortunately, the progress being made is not up to standard, and we are actually far from achieving this goal. So this year, the UN is organizing a conference to try to think about ways to accelerate uh, the work so that this goal can be met. And Professor, can you talk a little bit more about how climate change is impacting all of this? This is a really important question because with climate change, we see what might seem contradictory uh, signals around us. In some parts of the world, as we're experiencing here in California again, you have a very large amount of rain falling in a very short period of time. And in other parts of the world uh, or at over other times of the year, you have droughts. So these might seem confusing. But actually, these problems of drought and excess of water are only going to intensify with climate change. And that's why uh, we need to increase up awareness of this diversity and not draw attention to just one part of the equation as drought, but also to think about the other part of the equation, which is the excess of water that creates all sorts of uh, uh, harm and suffering around the world. 
And Professor, in your book, you say two things that are extremely striking. You say that water is a human right, and you say that getting people access to water is not as hard as we think. Is that correct? That it is correct. You know, many many of the problems that we have in the world, they're not very technically hard to solve. They are hard to reach consensus and organize collective action around. So the idea of the human right to water is something that was um, negotiated at the level of the United Nations in 2010. It was recognized as a human right. And before there, but also since then, this notion that it's a human right, people should have access to water, which doesn't necessarily mean that it is free. Many people think that one thing implies the other. In some circumstances, it might mean that water should, people shouldn't be charged for water, but that's not a universal claim. What is a universal claim is that societies need to make sure that all of their members have access to clean water for their basic needs. Such an important point. Thanks so much, Professor. And coming up, the future of everything. More on how schools across the country could set the stage for regulating social media. Then a report on what the world looks like four months after chat GPT and the warning signs for the artificial intelligence revolution. starting to brew between schools and social media. And we're not talking about teachers trying to get their students not to use their phones in class. We are talking about school districts nationwide, from Florida to California, suing social media giants in courts. And they say that TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, and Instagram are all contributing to the youth mental health crisis that we're seeing in the country. And the first of the lawsuits was filed by Seattle Public Schools. Then Florida, New Jersey, Pennsylvania are now also suing. And so is the San Mateo Education Board here in California. They are taking on YouTube, TikTok, and Snapchat. Now, San Mateo a County Superintendent of Schools, Nancy McGee, joins us now, along with Anne Marie Murphy, the lawyer representing the school district uh, in this lawsuit. Uh, Nancy, in the filing, you talk about the impacts that you've been seeing from all this. One example you cite is that devious lick uh, TikTok challenge that we saw quite a while ago. Uh, what have you seen happening in your schools? Well, you know, the uh, the TikTok challenges are one thing, but really the challenges in the schools are as various as there are students. Um, some students come with, uh, you know, distracted attention. They may have been up too late at night, um, online, not sleeping well. Um, we have students who are impacted by cyberbullying. Um, we've really worked hard with uh, companies to remove content when students are at threat uh, from a cyberbullying event, and that's very difficult to do. Um, and then you also have just the social network of young people. Their, their social network is online, and, and that can be good, and it can also be detrimental. So um, the problem is that it's 24-7, and it comes to school with them. And this is something that you don't necessarily see unless you really dive deep underneath the surface. Do you think parents are aware of what's going on? I absolutely do think that parents are aware. In fact, I have parents who reach out um, and ask for support and training. Uh, what kinds of uh, tools can we offer them? Um, when I, just in my casual conversations with parents of preteens or teenagers these days, they'll often reference the level of stress and anxiety that they see in their children or in their children's friends. And I'm a parent that I raised my kids uh, at that age about 10 years ago. And I would say the environment and the conditions for parenting of preteens and teens is vastly different than 10 years ago. And Anne, are you working with other districts in other states who have filed similar lawsuits? And, and one thing that I noticed, Instagram is not included in this particular filing. Uh, any reason for that? Actually, you're the first to know that just um, within the last hour, Instagram and the meta Facebook companies have been added to the lawsuit, so they are covered. Um, and we are working with a number of districts. We do expect to work with districts uh, uh, across the country. Um, uh, San Mateo and Seattle are just right at the very tip of this litigation, which we think 
will ultimately have the participation of hundreds, if not thousands, of school districts. And Nancy, the complaints listed in your lawsuit are public nuisance, negligence, uh, conspiracy, gross negligence, unfair competition, and RICO. Uh, pretty fascinated by the RICO. Uh, can you tell us how so? Well, well I'm going to turn, heard... turn it over to Anne Marie for that. Um, uh, she can give you the legal description about that. Yeah, so um, with the RICO claim, we're alleging that the companies um, have been working in lockstep and um, working in a very similar way in the way that they are purposefully using algorithms, um, advanced artificial intelligence and machine learning to direct their content at students. Um, so there's other examples of where you will see claims for public nuisance and RICO going hand in hand with, you know, there's uh, examples include opioids litigation, dual e-cigarette lit litigation, for example. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, fascinating. I, I do want to uh, mention, we've seen a lot of political momentum growing against TikTok uh, right now. We saw that the CEO, uh, he posted a TikTok. Now he's going to testify before Congress. Uh, what do you think we're going to see when he's testifying before Congress? Well, are you asking think, about? Yeah, go ahead, Anne Marie. Well, yes, there's. There, you're right. There has been a lot of um, discussion nationally about TikTok, and um, we ultimately hope that our Congress and the state legislatures across the country start acting, enacting reforms that will affect not just TikTok but social media in general. Um, you know, TikTok has um, some unique concerns and some unique background. Um, I, our, our case does not touch upon the security issues that are um, part of the public discourse right now. Uh, one question, final question I have for you. Uh, there's legislation and then there's regulation and then there's lawsuits. Do you think that legislation and regulation uh, are where they should be right now? No, not at all. Um, I think that we're just starting to see um, Congress and state legislatures focused on social media. Um, we have to remember that uh, our kids who are now tweens and teenagers, they're the first generation that has been fully raised with availability of social media. So this is an emerging issue that, our, our, that we have to address from a, from a policy standpoint. In California, our state legislature recently passed a law um, designed to protect children and limit what information can be collected of those that are under 18. And that legislative effort has been met by lawsuits from the industry. Um, so even when our, our state legislature tries to take a small step in the right direction, they're, they're met with resistance. Superintendent Nancy McGee and Anne Marie Murphy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. We've been talking a bunch about AI here, and for all the pros, there is a whole host of possible unintended consequences. And tonight, a pair of Silicon Valley insiders are raising the alarm about the dangers of AI, pointing out that tech companies might be jumping on this train a little too fast. NBC's Lester Holt sat down with them to learn more. It's hard to believe it's only been four months since ChatGPT launched, kicking the AI arms race into high gear. That was like firing the starting gun, that now all the other companies said, well, if we don't also deploy, we're going to lose the race to Microsoft. Tristan Harris is Google's former design ethicist. He co-founded the Center for Humane Technology with Azo Raskin. Both see in AI welcome possibilities. What we want is AI that enriches our lives, that is helping us cure cancer, that is helping us find climate solutions. But will the new AI arms race take us there or down a darker path? The race to deploy becomes the race to recklessness because they can't deploy it that quickly and also get it right. In the 2020 Netflix doc, The Social Dilemma, they sounded the alarm on the dangers of social media. We built these things and we have a responsibility to change it. But tonight, they have an even more dire warning about ignoring the perils of artificial intelligence. 
It would be the worst of all human mistakes to have ever been made. And we literally don't know how it works, and we don't know all the things it will do. And we're, we're putting it out there before we actually know whether it's safe. Raskin points to a recent survey of AI researchers, where nearly half said they believe there's at least a 10% chance AI could eventually result in an extremely bad outcome, like human extinction. Where do you come down on that? I don't know. The the, the like point that's, is that scares me. You don't know. Yeah. Well, right. here's the, here's the point. Like it's it's. Imagine you're about to get on an airplane, and 50 percent of the engineers um, that built the airplane say there's a 10 percent chance that the airplane might crash uh, and kill everyone. Leave me at the gate. Right. Yeah, exactly. AI tools can already mimic voices, ace exams, create art, and diagnose diseases, and they're getting smarter every day. In two years, by the time of the election. Human beings will not be able to tell the difference between what is real and what is fake. Who's building the guardrails here? No one is building the guardrails. And this has moved so much faster than our government has been able to understand or appreciate. It's important to note the CEOs of the major AI labs, and they've all said we do need to regulate AI. There's always that notion that, well, maybe these companies can police themselves. Does that work? No. No. Self-policing doesn't work. No. no, it cannot work. But doesn't a person ultimately control it? Can I simply just pull the plug? Unfortunately, this is being decentralized into more and more hands. So the technology isn't just run inside of one company that you can just say, I want to pull the plug on Google. Also, think about how hard it would be to pull the plug on Google or pull the plug on Microsoft. So what would you tell a CEO of a Silicon Valley company right now? And yeah, you don't want to be last, but can you take a pause? I mean, is that realistic? You, no, it's, you, you're right. It's not realistic to ask one company. What we need to do is get those companies have to come together in a constructive, positive dialogue about. Think of it like, you know, the nuclear test ban treaty, right? We we cut all the nations together, saying, can we agree we don't want to deploy nukes above ground? The stakes, they say, are impossibly high. But when we're we're in an arms race to deploy AI to every human being on the planet as fast as possible with as little testing as possible, that's not an equation that's going to end well. Such a good reminder of what's at stake. Lester, thanks so much. Up next, a whale of a tale. We've got a harrowing story of survival on the Pacific. A group of friends share their story after a whale sank their boat. And a group of friends has quite the story to tell after a boating trip quickly turned into a nightmare. A massive whale hit their boat, then it immediately started taking on water. The friends quickly called for help. The boat sank, and they spent the next several hours in lifeboats wondering if that call for help would come. Sam Brock has their incredible story. Oh, well, like the actual impact. From yeah. aboard the boat that came to his rescue. I, my initial thought was, <laughs> Rick Rodriguez describes a sensation that was unlike anything he'd ever experienced as a sailor. It sounded like something broke, and uh, we immediately looked to the side and we saw a really big whale bleeding. Four friends were sharing a pizza about a week ago on their long-awaited sailing excursion to Polynesia on board the Rain Dancer, when that initial jolt quickly forced them to snap into survival mode. It was just um, an incredible amount of water coming in. I felt like it was just a scene out of a movie, like everything was floating. At once, Rick sent on a mayday call to authorities and sent text messages to his brother Roger in Miami and friend Tommy Joyce, who was sailing a buddy boat in the area, specifically there for safety. Tommy, this is no joke. We hit a whale and the ship went down. We're in the life raft. We need help ASAP. What followed was a digital version of telephone involving texts, WhatsApp messages, the U.S. Coast Guard, and the Peruvian government. But as the friends anxiously waited on an inflatable life raft and dinghy, a sign of hope. And then I posted on uh, Facebook's uh, Boat Watch, and it was the Boat Watch group that ended up uh, having somebody on there that knew a sailing vessel, Rolling Stone. Think about 60 miles, 65 miles away when we realized that we were the closest yeah, yeah. boat. Nine hours later, that boat, named Rolling Stones, pinpointed their exact location and scooped up the four sailors. We saw them so far out, and then we realized we're still like an hour and a half away from them. But for that hour and a half, we were really, really excited. For this confident group, there was never any doubt they'd survive, even in rough waters.
this experience made me realize how, uh, you know, how capable we are and how, um, how skilled we are to, to manage and cope with situations like this. Sam Brock, NBC News. <laughs> Rolling Stone for the win. Before we go, how about a daily dose of animals that deserve some hugs for our 60 seconds of joy? Because if you're looking for a new job, might we suggest professional bear hugger? Yeah, that's a real thing. And the New Mexico Department of Fish and Game is currently hiring for it. Technically, they're hiring conservation officers, but hugging baby bears is part of the gig. Other requirements also include the courage to crawl into bear dens. So it's almost a dream job. Also, everyone, please, let's take a moment to congratulate Mr. Pickles, because the 90-year-old tortoise just became a first-time father. Those are his three little hatchlings. They were born at the Houston Zoo. They're named none other than Bill, Jalapeno, Gherkin, and the arrival of these little pickles is kind of a big deal, or should we say Dill, because this particular breed of tortoise is critically endangered. Mr. Pickles is also the oldest animal at the Houston Zoo, where he has lived for 36 years alongside the love of his life, Mrs. Pickles. That does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We're going to see you tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.